Welcome back to the Business Experience Show, where you can learn from others' experiences and successes in business. Welcome to the Business Biography, powered by the Business Experience Show. I'm your host, Lisa Caprelli. We have co-host Cole Smith. We have Ted Hankin, chair of the Probate Trust and Estates Division for Alvarado Smith. Ted's an attorney who's been giving advice on tax, business, and estate planning matters for over 35 years. Welcome, Ted. Thank you for having me. Yes. So you're both an attorney and a CPA. Give us a brief synopsis of how you got started and why you wanted to get into practicing law. Well, I was born into a family of accountants. My father was a CPA. He had his own practice. My mother was his office manager and a public accountant. When I was seven years old, I was going to the office helping out during tax season. I grew up with it. I, when I was 16, he had a driver's license, drove around in my father's clients, helped write up the books, get trial balances. So by the time I got to UCLA and as an undergrad, the question was, what was I going to do? I knew accounting. That doesn't mean I liked accounting. <laughs> so finally, yeah. uh, I took accounting classes through the graduate school. They counted it as undergraduate units. Took a course from a professor named Fred Slaughter who taught business law. And from that point on, I decided, yeah, I think I want to go to law school. You told me that he really inspired you. Yes, he was great. And what made his class exciting? You know, I can't give you a specific memory of a specific class at this point in time. I remember being there. I remember being up in the back. I remember seeing this tall man who used to be a center uh -huh. on the NC2A championship teams with John Wooden, and okay. he would just... He just connected. He yeah. just connected. It's, it's Absolutely. nice hearing the stories like that when you connect with your professor. Then you became a sole practitioner from 1986 to 2008. Tell us about that experience. Well, I had been a partner in a law firm in Santa Ana, a small firm, and I had a client make me an offer I couldn't refuse. Hmm. So I went out with that client, and unfortunately that client decided to go bankrupt about nine months later. And Ouch. I had a choice, nine months. He had a financial statement that you wouldn't believe, but it was all raw land, no cash flow. Oh, that doesn't work. No, that, <laughs> it didn't then. But in any event, I had a choice to make, which is go out and try to work for somebody else or try it on my own. My father did it on his own, so I figured I'd try to do the same thing. That lasted for about 22 years. So you were still a practitioner for 22 years? Right. And then tell us, uh, going forward, what happened next? Well, I... Uh, replaced an individual, a gentleman by the name of uh, Robert Bacon. He's been practicing law for something like 55 years. I'd have to say he's my hero. I'm doing it 35. He makes me feel like a young pup. And he had retired, and they were looking for another attorney to take over his position at the firm, and I was recruited. Did you ever practice as an accountant or a CPA at all? Well, I am certified. I keep my license current. Certainly, I have abilities that I use in representing my clients and in doing my work, but I do not do accounting per se. Uh, many times, I'll have somebody come up and say, well, you can do the accounting, too. And I say, no, you won't. <laughs> you can do the accounting, too? I have good friends who are accountants, and they're a lot cheaper than I am, and I think you should go talk to them. Yeah, but, it's but, important but, to stay focused. Go yeah, ahead. but having that CPA background uh, as a practitioner is, has to be beneficial to you, though. Oh, it does. It gives me a certain amount of respect when I sit down in a transaction and meet with the other side. Right. What and, is? Go ahead, Cole. Uh, no, just to, what's, your, what's your specialty now? Over the last 22 years you've been practicing, what would you say your specialty is? Well, now at the uh, firm, I am the chair of the probate trust and estate division, which means I am supervising and in charge of anything that has to do with the probate, with the trust, with uh, guardianship, conservatorship. If there's litigation involved with those things, I'm the guy that goes to court over it. So it's, uh, it's all those different things that I do now. Plus, uh, I have clients uh, for 28 years, I think I counted back on one of them, who have me do various business transactions because that's what I was doing for them when I was uh, first met with them. And that just keeps going on. I have a question. An obvious choice for someone with your background would be to work for the IRS. You certainly would have had that choice available throughout the years, but you decided to remain in private practice. Is that because you have the spirit of an entrepreneur? Well, there's a lot of reasons for that. Remember, I grew up in a CPA oh, really? firm. Yeah. And my father was an independent CPA, and I grew up hearing the IRS was the enemy. Yeah. So working for the government was never an option for me. How does, uh, I, I want to talk about probate. We, we talked recently about creating a will or setting up a trust and avoiding probate. You gave me some good advice there. Can you talk about that? 
Well, probate is um, the government supervised transfer of your assets after a person dies. And probate is very regulated. There's lots of statutes that apply. It will work. It will take time. It will be public. And it will be expensive because attorneys get paid according to a statutory schedule. For example, a $500,000 estate, I believe the statutory fee is $13,000. Wow. And a million dollars, you're talking $23,000. Now, if you had a trust, you wouldn't have to go through probate, assuming that you dealt with the trust properly. In other words, it was funded. You transferred assets into it. Whatever assets are in the trust at the time that you die won't be probated. Ergo, you don't have to pay those fees that would otherwise be paid to a probate attorney. What happens if you don't have a document signed or a trust or anything like that? Well, then we call it an intestacy. An intestacy is when someone dies without a will, yeah. and then it's just the probate code that decides who inherits what. You go through a probate, and you have to deal with it that way. Wow. So if I were to die without a will, it goes to probate automatically? Correct. So in order to avoid probate, which seems like the enemy word, you need to see someone like you to get a to get a will to get to get even a trust. A trust has the highest protection, is what I, I understand. Well, a trust will get you outside of probate. There are other ways to get out of probate. For example, if you hold property as a joint tenant, and remember, I have to qualify this. I'm a California attorney, and I'm talking about California law right now. Right. Okay. But if you have a joint tenancy with right of survivorship. Uh, that would be one way of not going through probate, but there are tax disadvantages for holding property that way. So you really have to sit down and consider. Most people don't have the ability to read the tax code. I've been studying it for 35 years, and I still don't understand the bloody thing. <laughs> but the uh, talking to someone who knows what they're doing, who has the experience, who has the ability – is the way to go if you want to do something that your survivors, your family, will appreciate and consider a gift to them after you die. You're not going to be there to see it, but if you have yourself organized, if you have things taken care of, I have seen it, and how much easier it is for the surviving spouse, for the children, knowing that their deceased parent did what should have been done and took care of things before he where she went. There was a, a case that, that with the famous painter here in the news in the last couple of months, and uh, he passed away, and he didn't have a, from what I understand, he didn't have a trust or anything, and there was a handwritten note from him to his his ex, for, and his kids are, from what I understand, they don't have access to it, so they're fighting it in court. Is that legal, not legal? How do you handle a situation where somebody hand write this, handwrites those things? Well, you can have what's called a holographic will. And in California, a holographic will is a document that's written entirely in your own hand, is dated and signed, and expresses an intent that it be your will. And provided that you've done those things, it will be a will that can be probated, and it will legally satisfy the requirements. Yeah, but in that case, I think that uh, all the kids, the whole family was completely left out, and everything went to his, his wife, wow. ex-wife or wife. Well... You know, that's the other part of what I do, which is litigate over wills and trusts. And then you have issues of undue influence. You have issues of incompetence at the time that the uh, document was signed. And so, yeah, family members hire attorneys, and we go at it in court to try to prove or disprove whether that document should be probated. It is part of what happens. Can you give an example of a case that turned out differently than you initially thought, than you initially expected? For example, somebody uh, you comes to you, they, you're looking at so someone's deceased, they come to you and they think this is going to go this way and it went completely different because of law or because of other parties well, interjecting. Well, I've certainly had cases where someone had come to me and they said their spouse had died and here was a uh, trust document or a will and I'm getting all set up. Okay, this is how we're going to administer the estate. Mm -hmm. This is what we have to do to 
comply with the law, and out of the blue comes somebody else along saying, oh, no, no, that document doesn't work. Um, and by the way, that account that's in there was supposed to have been left to me, and therefore none of the rest of the family should have anything to do with it. So what happens at that point? You try to negotiate something so you don't end up spending everything in the estate. You want to be able to preserve as much as you can, but if you can't negotiate, you litigate. And I'm sure you see people that try to do it themselves, do it themselves wills, do it themselves kits when it comes to trust. What what do you I like how you said earlier by the way, you said if, if people take the time to do it correctly, it's a gift. Right. Well, you know, I've seen people try to run a probate through the probate court in pro per. That means without an attorney. Okay. It can be done, but it's difficult. I mean, what attorneys are, they're guides. We take you through the forest of the statutes, and we help guide you to where it is you need to be at the end of the road. Uh, you can try doing it yourself. There's nothing illegal about you representing yourself. Lots of people do it. It's just that it's usually harder, longer, and they don't necessarily do a good job. Plus, when you're gone, when you're dead, I mean, you're no longer around. You don't. How do you? You, you want to make sure it's your what you wanted is executed correctly after you, you die it's the only way to reach out after the grave and tell everyone this is how i want things done and if you have no interest in that you don't care if the state of california gets it or you don't care how it goes then you don't have to write a will you don't have to write a trust it just gets probated there are certain rules for smaller estates like under one hundred and fifty thousand dollars you can avoid a probate if there's no real estate in it but for the majority of homeowners let's say in california even with all of the recession mm -hmm. most people have a home and if it's going to be worth more than twenty thousand dollars you have to probate we got to take a quick break. We're listening to Ted Hankin, Chair of the Probate Trust and Estates Division for Alvarado Smith. What is your website for people listening? Uh, the firm has the website alvaradosmith.com. I have a website, newportbeachbusinesslawyer.com. I also have a blog, californiastatelawyerblog.com. Ted Hankin, he's an attorney who's been giving advice in tax, business, and estate planning matters for over 35 years. He'll be returning with the business biography. I'm Lisa Caprelli with Cole Smith. You're listening to Angels Radio, AMA 30 KLAA. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Are you an entrepreneur who would like to increase your business by becoming more recognizable in your field? Ever considered authoring a book, being on radio, or strengthening your brand, but you haven't yet? Hi, I'm Lisa Caprelli with the Business Experience Show. I can help you remake or revitalize your professional image in ways you only dreamed about or never imagined. Through business, marketing, and networking, I can show you how to put the passion and fun back in what you do. Visit goglossy.com for a free consultation. I would love to help you achieve more. Visit goglossy.com. Welcome back to The Business Experience Show, where you can learn from others' experiences and successes in business. Welcome back. I'm Lisa Caprelli. We have Cole Smith. Joining us is Ted Hankin, Chair of the Probate Trust and Estates Division for Al Alvarado Smith. We're talking about wills, how to avoid probate if you can. Ted, can you share with our audience, you've been an attorney for over 35 years. Uh, I'm sure you have many stories of inside the courtroom, outside the courtroom, how to avoid litigation. Give us the story where you helped someone that you said, you know, I'm glad I represented that, that party. Well, anytime I can help a client, I'm happy that I've been able to represent them properly. I mean, that's the whole point of being an advocate. Right. Attorneys are advocates. We take representation and we try to get the best result for a client. I never want to go to court, however, with a client unless I can look that judge straight in the face and be able to believe what it is that I'm saying. So you have to be somewhat choosy in who you represent. Litigation's expensive. So people have to be aware of that when they go in. A recent case where I've been involved had to do with a woman who died without a will. Mm -hmm. And she was in a partnership. And in this partnership, the document that was supposed to control everything in terms of buyout of her interest, the other side didn't want to abide by it. So, yes, there was litigation involved. I had to open a probate. I had to file what's called an 850 petition, it's a probate code section, and litigate with the other side in order to get what was really the entitlement of this estate, this woman's interest in that business. Uh, that was successful. 
What are, well, how, how would you, from a business, uh, uh, from the listeners that are out there, the business owners or, or just people in general, um, a lot of people try to do it on their own. How would they go about and why should they contact you or contact an attorney uh, to help them avoid yeah, those types of question. situations? Well, if you use an attorney correctly, you're going to stay out of trouble. And that's one of the biggest reasons I can think of to go to an attorney is to avoid trouble before it happens. One of the reasons that I've had clients for so many years is they haven't been sued because we've talked about what needed to happen ahead of time. We planned for things and therefore we were able to avoid the trouble. But in generally, again, people have the right to do things on their own. They just may not do it well. So I would say if you're gonna go open a business, if you're going to go and do some estate planning, at least have a consultation. The time will be well spent. The money will be well spent. If you choose to go forward with that attorney, that's fine. If you choose not to, that's okay too. But at least you'll get the information you need to know what to do right. With respect to wills, you have situations, well, I'd say any parent of a young child would want to have a will. Sure. Because it's in wills that you name guardians. You can have a guardian of the person. You can have a guardian of the estate. They can be the same people. They can be different people. But the guardian is who's going to raise that child if the parents are gone. Sure. And the guardian of the estate is who's going to manage that child's money if the parents are gone. If you want to have some say over who that's going to be, the best place that I know to do that is in a will. If you don't have a will and the awful happens, the plane goes down and the children are left with the sitter, what happens to them? Who's yeah. going to take care of them? The question I have, though, is that we're business owners and families. We're busy, 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 busy. We don't have time to uh, stop. What would you tell them on uh, to, to, to make them and take the initiative to get that done. And, I, and I'm and i a business owner myself and have been for a long time, and it's like, oh, I'll get to it, I'll get to it. You? No, nobody likes to face their own mortality. <laughs> That's right. Nobody likes to think that they're going to die. Mm. Right. But, in fact, it's inevitable. You we bet. all do. Yeah, death and taxes. <laughs> yep. And the issue of how that's going to go over and how the family is going to deal with it, uh, as I have said, has to do with do I want to make it easy – Er, for my surviving family to deal with my business or do I not care and that's really the bottom line it, for example if you have a business and your spouse has been with you all along but the spouse doesn't work in the business mm -hmm. and for purposes of this discussion the spouse is going to die as the husband because husbands always go first <laughs> so husband dies wife is not in the business but the business is successful. Maybe the business has 50 employees, 100 employees, 10 employees. What happens to that business? Is there a business succession plan in place? Have you been planning for perhaps a key manager or mm -hmm. a key employee who can step up and run things? Will the business have to be sold? If there's a partner in the business and the surviving spouse is out there, does that partner want your wife as his partner right, or her partner? And so there are all sorts of issues that we try to think of as attorneys, we try to address as attorneys, we want to address all contingencies that we can possibly think of. We're not perfect, but we do try. Right. And that way, again, with a business owner, you're doing something for your family. You're doing something also, if it's a business succession plan, for your employees. Because presumably, if they're loyal employees, they've worked for you for years, you'd rather not see them out of work because the business closed because you died. Yeah. Right, good. Ted, you have 35 years of experience. How are you getting your message out there with your passion and wanting to help these guys put their probate and their wills and trust in place? Well, as I mentioned, I have uh, my blog, CaliforniaEstateLawyerBlog.com. I have the website newportbeachbusinesslawyer.com the firm has its website alvaradosmith.com um, i give free consultations people call me up i'm happy to talk to them on the telephone uh, give whatever knowledge i can provide them based on the information that they give me i get a lot of referral business i also get a you know, cpas refer business to me insurance people various sources plus i have clients 
that give me repeat business. So yeah. that always works. And the other thing, I guess, in terms if you want to focus on the wills, estates, and so on, most attorneys will tell you a trust or will has a shelf life of about seven years. Okay. And it's been about seven years since you talked to anybody about it. You probably should take it out, dust it off, give it a read, and maybe go consult for an hour. Right. Make sure that it still does what you want it to do, that the laws haven't changed, so that you can rest assured that things will happen the way that you want them to happen. Again, you're gone. You're not going to be there dictating anything, but you try to plan for it. Through this uh, economy over the last uh, four years, has it gone up, down? Have you seen the referrals uh, slow down, everything? How are you using your digital uh, footprint and your space online to, to attract new business? Well, the blog generates traffic for me i get right. calls probably one two three a week I, i'd like to make he should be number one in orange county <laughs> i take advantage you have and i see this all the time with businesses you have the experience you i like for you to have more of the technology yeah. right so that because we see this cole and i we see this when we're helping businesses when we are talking about their marketing and, and uh, social media thumbprint and platform is you someone can come out of college or you know they start a business but they don't have the experience yeah it's that 40 year old and uh, above that's uh that we're used to the old way of doing business and then there's the 40 and old, uh, younger well you know we did have a conversation before the show and cole brought something up that i thought was very astute and that was the fact that if you want to do business with the younger generation mm -hmm. you got to be able to do facebook twitter what other stuff yeah. out there and me, I'm just going running down the hall asking, where's a teenager? <laughs> so, yeah, I, I, thought, I thought that was really good advice you give. I don't know how to do it, but maybe somebody will show me how. Well, it's just understanding, it, marrying the two or putting the two together where you've, you put the business uh, experience and the, and the technology behind and each other. And basically, really, you're helping each other accomplish that same goal. You're teaching them a, a, a valuable service, and they're giving you a valuable service as well. Right. There, and there's lots of services out there that rank service professionals, like Ted being an attorney. Uh, there's so many platforms out there with Google, and how how do you get on the top of, of Google with well, SEO? Well, it's really more about a strategy, what you right. want to do, and then you set that and you execute that strategy. Every professional out there is running through the same problem. Especially uh, in the They're still past going through the years. old years. Uh, I mean, I've seen it for the last five years years where uh, these the professional side of uh, the business they've done great and they're wondering why everything's disappearing right uh, you know they used to have the referrals and the leads and and Lisa you just brought it up shortly it's like what do you do this guy, kid comes out of college and all of a sudden he's on the first page and he's getting the right. referrals but he has no experience right so you got to marry the two together and it, it's it's uh, you've got a lot of valuable information I'd like to see you get it out there Ted uh, and not only that I'd also like for you to think about how how you can put your information into a, uh, a video archive that information is very valuable so that when you're you know you retire you're gone and you left your probate that there's you're going to still be teaching <laughs> a legacy huh <laughs> where are your offices right. located ted uh the offices are in santa Ana. the address is one macarthur place suite 200 uh, we also have the firm has offices in los angeles and san francisco as well some clients might be intimidated by working with an attorney at a sizable law firm and think that it's very expensive. It's, is that just a myth? Is it real? Or is that going to help them? Well, you know, as a sole practitioner, I charge a certain hourly rate. And as an attorney in a firm, I charge a certain hourly rate. Not a whole heck of a lot difference because experience is what drives the rates. The more experience the attorney is, the more rate he can justify. Presumably, he can be more efficient. And I should say she may be more efficient. Yeah. Uh, and therefore, the money, while it may seem like a lot per hour, can still be well spent because you're going to get what you need and you're going to get it fast. Ted, why would you use a, a large firm like yourself versus a small practitioner or a law firm? You know, when you work with a firm, you're working with an individual. Mm -hmm. You have a point of contact, whether it's me, whether it's one of my associates, whoever it might be, you have to click with that individual. It's all relationship. If the relationship is there, it doesn't matter what size the firm is. Right. It doesn't matter whether it's a sole practitioner. Yeah. Ted, we have to have him back in the, on the show. We have so much valuable information. Ted, if someone wants to follow, follow in your footsteps, what advice would you like to give? Work hard, learn hard, 
give 100% all the time. You represent the client. You're in a service business. And when you're in a service business, Mm -hmm. clients expect you to do what they want for them in the best way possible. So your attitude has to be, if I'm representing that client, I'm giving 100% all of the time. Well, thank you for being on our show. For more information on Ted Hankin, you can go to thebusinessexperienceshow.com. Ted Hankin is the chair of the Probate, Trust, and Estates Division for AlvaradoSmith.com. He's an attorney who's been giving advice on tax business and in estate planning for over 35 years. We also had Michael Lloyd at the top of the hour, media consultant and author. Thanks to Cole Smith. Thanks to our radio show producer, Brian Gaps. Thanks, thanks for listening. Have a profitable week. For more information on any of our guests, please, again, go to thebusinessexperienceshow.com. Uh, like us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter. Theme music by Mike Werner. I'm Lisa Caprelli. See you next week on Angels Radio, AMA 30 KLAA. What a great show.